it's, hard, it's sometimes just so easy to, because we're retired, because we're worn out, because we've got so much going on in our lives, we can be so distracted, can't we? Um, we can get, uh, we, you know, we might be doing something. I, there's times during the week when I'm, when I'm studying and I'm trying to focus and trying to get, get to prepare for Sunday, and my mind goes in a hundred other places, and I, and I find myself all of a sudden I'm looking at the computer and I'm typing something in on the computer. This week, we got on Facebook for the very I got on Facebook for the first time. Ardell's had Facebook forever. And uh, I, I broke down, I gave in, I said, okay, I'll get on Facebook because so many of you are on Facebook. So now, this week, your job, your task, your, your um, uh, mission, so if you just choose to take it, is to make sure you add me to your Facebook so I know what's going on in all your lives. See, I like Facebook. I didn't think that was a big deal. But on Facebook, I can go on your page and see what you've been talking about. Like, as the girls, I like uh, Madeline and Johanna and Nathaniel are talking about it. It's called, what do you guys call it? Um, stalking. So now I can stalk creeping, you. Creeping, creeping. Creeping. Yeah, creeping. Stalking. But, but that's not what Facebook's for. It's, it's good. It's, I think it looks like a great way to communicate between all of us. And, uh, and hopefully... Uh, we can you can use it to, for for the good and uh, and for something worthwhile. So that's your job this week. So don't get distracted. Don't get off off task. Make sure you add me this week because otherwise I'll feel like I have no friends and it will be really sad. And uh, but no, actually a whole bunch of people have already added me. It's kind of interesting and uh, interesting place to go to. This morning though, we're looking at Matthew chapter 14, which was read by Jeff this morning and. Before I forget, I'm going to turn my cell phone off because last time I didn't do this, I was at a funeral and I stood up to preach and my cell phone went off and I gave everybody a dirty look until I realized it was my pocket that was making noise. <laughs> so I don't want to do that to you this morning. So if you have your cell phone, remember to turn it off because I didn't have this in slide didn't go up this morning, right? So it's, it's off my mind. But Matthew chapter uh, 14 verses 22 through 33 really is what our, our focal passage is going to be. And as Jesus is walking on the water, if you look at most of your Bible, it's titled Walking on the Water, or Jesus Walking on the Water. But also in this passage, we see that someone else who walks on the water also. Um, what I titled my message this morning is eyes, Keeping Our Eyes on the Prize. And uh, often, like I said, we, 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 many of us get to doing something and get so distracted so easily. Like I did this week when I was trying to do my study, my reading, and, uh, and I found myself... Um, Going on Facebook, it's a it's a little addictive little thing actually too, isn't it? So you get it's easy to get distracted, even though you have something very very important that you're trying to accomplish. We can be we can be we, we can so quickly get diverted over to other things. We can be driving, playing sports, reading, you name it. It's so easy to be distracted by our surroundings. This can be no big deal, but there's times though that can be very dangerous for us to be distracted, isn't it? Uh, it can be a matter of life and death if we, that, that we stay focused. You know, you think of a tightrope walker. As he walks across the road, if he gets distracted by the crowd, that's a bad thing. Especially if he has no net. You know, can you imagine him just looking and getting distracted because someone's out there, some crazy guy's out there trying to get his attention and waving at him and everything? He has to focus on his, on his balance, keeping things centered and on that rope so he knows where he's walking. And so forth. And then there's guys that are crazy enough to, you know, to tight rope across places like Niagara Falls and things like that, or across between buildings and cities. You can't, you can't be distracted by the traffic. You can't be distracted by the things around you. You've got to keep your eye on the prize, so to speak. Keep your focus on the end, and so that you don't, you don't uh, fall to your death. You and I as Christians must keep our focus on what's really important. If you go over to Hebrews chapter 12, quickly, and you hold your, if you keep your finger in Matthew chapter 14, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, but if you go over to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this is what we read, it says, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, and run with endurance the race that lies before us. Now listen to this, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy laid before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of, of God, of God's throne. So in other words, he's saying, don't let the things that are alive entangle us. Don't let the things that so easily grip us and take us away from our, our, what we're supposed to be focusing on, and that is who? Jesus Christ. 
keeping our mind focused on Him. So, you know, it's so easy, even in church, even in, in, our, in our activities and things like that, we can be a very busy church. We can't let the activities take our focus off who Christ is. We have lots of things going on around us. We have fellowships, we have uh, Bible studies, we, you know, which kind of sounds funny to say that that can be a distraction. But, uh, or we have um, all kinds of things that we're doing. Going on campouts, or going, or going sleeping in the basement of a church, or going and doing all kinds of things. We can't let those things distract us from the goal of finishing that race, running that race, and keeping our eyes and our focus on Jesus Christ. So often, you know, even like we, we get wrapped up in personalities, and churches are really good for that because we're, it's all about relationships. We're here because we found friends. We're here because we have family. We're here because, because someone's invited us. We're here for all kinds of different reasons. Mostly it's because of a relationship that we built with somebody else. And that is great. That's important. And that's what, that's what church is all about. Being a family, being um, a body, being an assembly. Who is, but our focus is on who? On Jesus Christ. If we want to grow in our faith and understanding of Jesus, we must stay our, keep our focus on Him. As if we, as if we are, are to reach the world, and, and if we are, for me, if we are to reach a world that is lost and dying without Jesus, we have to keep our eyes on the task. We have to keep our eyes on, the, on our Savior. Listen to another passage in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, it says this. I have to find my spot here. It says, do, not, do you not know that runners in the stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. However, they do not receive a perishable crown, but, a, but an imperishable one. Therefore, I do not run like one who runs aimlessly, or box like one who beats the, beats the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it to understand strict control, so pardon me, and bring it to under, bring it under strict control, so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So what is Paul telling the, the church of Corinth? He's telling them that he, uh, I'm, I'm going to run with a purpose. I'm running with a, with a goal. I'm running so that I don't get distracted. I don't get pulled aside. I don't get moved off the, off the track. I stay in my lane. I keep my goal with a purpose. Or in the, he even uses the idea of boxing. And he's, you know, it's the idea that I'm not just pounding the air. I'm actually going with a purpose. I'm going to hit the other guy on the other side. I'm going to, I'm going to do the job. I'm going to do damage. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. So that's what Paul's say, telling us, telling the church of Corinth here, is that we need to keep focused. We need to keep our eye on the prize. Keep our eye on Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to try to look at this morning. Today we see how Jesus taught his disciples of this lesson while they were out, a, out for a boat ride in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 down through verse 33. And so let's pray together as we begin our time in God's purpose. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come now and continue our time of worship in, the, in your word. And Father, I just pray you guide us and direct us this morning as we look into your word. Help us to understand that how we need to interact with you in our lives. And help us to, to keep our focus on you as we, as we hear, this, hear your message this morning. And I pray for these things now in your son's precious name, of Jesus Christ, our master and savior. Amen. So first, let's look at, the, get an idea of what's going on here in Matthew chapter 14. It's this, we get kind of the setting. This verse is, we look at the setting as verses 22 through 26. But we can actually go up for a little bit further. If we went through the whole chapter, we see all kinds of things that have been going on. First off, we get, there's news that, that John the Baptist, the one who baptized Jesus, was actually beheaded by that at this point. And um, then we also get to the story in here, before this passage, and, and, and that is, or before it was our text, is that we see the feeding, excuse me, of the 5,000. Now that's an interesting story in itself, because um, it talks about 5,000 men. So I. What I get the impression of is actually it's kind of like Jesus fed the city of uh, uh, the city of about fifteen thousand people because he's got to include the children. That's just one child and one one uh, uh, mother and father together. So if it, when he says he fed five thousand, he actually fed 
a small town, a small city. So that kind of gives you a perspective on what's going on here. And, uh, and the reality here is that Jesus has been really busy. And he and his disciples have been extremely worked and extremely crowded and, and so forth. And um, Which brings us to verse 22. And, and the, the, the people have been fed. The thing, all these things have been going on. And Jesus tells his disciples immediately, he made his disciples go into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. So he's there, he sends him in the boat to cross over the Sea of Galilee. And they get it going across the sea and they encounter a, a, a big storm. Now, I'm guessing that they actually probably, they left after dinner and in more maybe a European time style. So they might have had supper was probably around, you know, 7 or 8 o'clock at night. So they're getting in the boats around that time of night after they've been fed. And, they, and Jesus sends them over across ahead of him to try to get them some rest, try to get them a break. And he himself, we see, actually goes up in this passage here, in these first few verses, he goes up to the mountaintop to, to, to pray. I find this, in, in, we, could, we could preach a whole lesson on this, the fact that Jesus took time to pray. Jesus took time to go re, re, recharge his batteries, so to speak. I see in this passage, he's gone up to the mountaintop, he's, going, he's spending some time to pray, he's spending some time with the Lord, and I just think that he's been, he's been experiencing all these people and finding all these, them bringing people to himself, to him to be healed, and he's fed by, or fed by the, the 10 to 15,000 people, and, and so forth, and he needs a break, so he had sent his disciples ahead, and now all we see in the story here, the waves start to come, or start to, to come up, the wind starts to blow, and it's coming into the, to what, what the guess is and the commentaries suggest, it's about 3 a.m. in the morning. And all they, the only distance they've gotten on a trip that's supposed to be roughly five miles across the Sea of Galilee, they've gotten one mile. So from about, let's say, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, six hours of rowing and six hours of working on, the, on this boat, they've been only able to manage to get one mile on this trip. Can you imagine what they've been facing? Now I've been to sea, and I've been uh, on board ship, and, and uh, I've been in, steering a, a, a ship about 200, 200 feet long, 150 to 200 feet long, and fighting uh, with an engine running, the, the, the trying to keep yourself on course. And you're, you're, you know, the waves hit you, the wind's blowing you, and it's total work, and that's not rowing. That's just standing at a wheel, in a wheelhouse, trying to keep the, on track of the, of the compass on the mark that, that you're trying, the, the, the officer of the watch is giving to you. And it's, it's a struggle. It's mentally, physically demanding. It's, it's, it's an incredible task. And these young, these young men, uh, the disciples of Christ, are, are in this boat, rowing as hard as they can and against the waves and against the wind, and they're just, they're just beaten to death. The wind is blowing, the waves are crashing over the boat, and there comes an interesting part of the story. It says, around 3 in the morning, verse 25, he came towards them walking on the sea. And then the disciples, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried, at, and cried out with fear. So we see what's happened here now, is Jesus sees them struggling on the sea. And he decides that he's going to walk out to them across the water. Now, some of us, you know, we, I, I don't know if you've ever been to sea, or if you've ever experienced that kind of storm. We were out golfing this last week, and we were, had hail and a downpour, and it was miserable. And we were only out there for about 50 minutes in the rain and the hail. And we were, I think most of us were, I, I was ready to, I wouldn't admit it at, at that moment, but I was ready to walk off the course and just go home. Because I was, I was, I felt terrible at that point. I was cold and everything. And these guys are like that too. They're mentally tired, they're mentally worn out. They're ready to probably quit. They probably just rather just go back and just roll the other way. But Jesus gave them a, a command to go across the, the lake. And uh, they see this bigger coming across. Can you imagine this? This guy walking on the water with no struggle. With no difficulty. And I, I just, in my mind, I'm going, I, I can understand why they, they 
scream out in terror, in terror. They're, they, they're afraid. And, that, uh, and then when they also uh, call, I think it's a ghost. And um, now this is not to say that there's ghosts in the world. This is not the scripture to say that, that there's actually really ghosts or anything like that. But they're terrified. Which brings us to verse 27 through 29. The power found in simple faith. Immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. In the middle of this, this disciple struggle, Jesus comes in the middle of a great storm and says three things that should bring comfort to any of us in the middle of great stress, right? Have courage. Are you facing a struggle in your life? Are you having a hard time? Are you been trying to battle the storm of life? Have you been trying to, to row across the lake and you just can't seem to get any further? Listen to what Jesus is telling his disciples and he's telling us about them too. Have courage. Why? Because it's I. It's your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So have courage. It's, it's me that's coming to help you. It's me that's walking across this lake to, 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 to save your lives. So don't be afraid. So he tells them, have courage. It's I. It's Jesus. Don't be afraid. Just take courage. I'm, I'm going to help you. I'm here to give you the way to go. I'm going to give you the strength, the, the power, the ability to make it across this lake. Don't be afraid. And when there, there are storms in our life, and we're about to lose focus on Jesus, we need to do the very same thing. And this message is for you and I. But only one of the twelve, though, was willing to stand up and try to do what Jesus says. Here we find... In verse 28, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you on the, come out to you on the water. Can you imagine? The power of simple faith, the power of just believing. That Peter was able to say, Lord, if it's you, I, mean, I know I can come where you are. And what does Jesus say? He simply says, Come. Now, I've been in deep water enough. I've been in stormy water. I've been, in, I've jumped off. We were on, I remember being out on, on the west coast, and we were doing a, on a little training boat, and uh, we're out traveling around. And uh, me and this other fellow get the, the rainstorm. We're gonna put these guys, to, to these trainees, uh, training officers, to officers under training to the task, and we're gonna see how they respond. And so we put life jackets on, and we put our shirts, you know, our work uniform on over top of our life jackets, and we go, we walk down both sides of the ship little ship and we walk to the corners of the back of the ship and we jump off. And it was it was the wind the breath was just taken right out of you. It's cold, it's miserable. The water you think on the west coast is supposed to be nice and warm. It's not. We were in the water for about 20 minutes because these guys couldn't figure out how to get the boat off the off the, off the ship and they just struggled and struggled and it was terrible. So I so if, if, if I if I was Peter I'll be honest with you, I had a hard time stepping off the back of that boat and coming and walking out to Jesus. But if we're willing to have faith to step out of the boat, even in the middle of a storm, Jesus is willing to help us. Now remember, the wind is still blowing. It's not, the storm isn't over. The wind is still blowing, the waves are still crashing. But as Peter steps out, he now is doing what seems to be the impossible. You see, in your life, you might be facing storms, you might be facing hard times, you might be facing struggles, but if you are willing and, and trust that God's got something for you to do, and you say, Lord, if it's your if you command it, if you if you command me, I'll come out, I'll step out, I'll come to you. And he says, Come, all we need to do is just trust him and believe in him and just step out, and you, you and I. Do the impossible. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 tells us that. It says, if you're willing to, if you trust God, if you believe, He's able and willing to do more than we can imagine or think. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, listen to what it says there in that passage. Again, this is Jesus speaking to, his, to, to those around us. But Jesus looked at them and said, With men this is impossible, with God all things are possible. 
You know, if you're facing a, str a struggle in your life, if you're facing uh, difficulties, if you're, not, if you're trying to figure out what you're supposed to be doing, well, you know what, man, things are, these things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with God. With God in the world. And then we go on and just to, to I got a little I'm running short of time, but it's the verse 30 and 30 through 33, we see something interesting that happens. And that can happen to all of us, too. In verse 30, 30, we see something that most of us can relate to. It says there in verse 30, But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. You know, there's times that we, we step out of the boat. But then there's times we get in the middle of the battle, of the struggle, of the difficulty. And we lose our focus and we get distracted and we begin to sin. But Peter knew where he was. He calls out to the Lord. And the Lord, in verse 31, Jesus reaches out his hand and caught hold of him. In the storms of life, Jesus put out his hand and catches. You know, we might be a believer, we, and we might be a strong Christian, but we get out there in the middle of the lake, and the wind is blowing, the great waves are crashing against us, and we have that moment of like, oh no, we can't do this anymore. And the great thing is to know, and I think the comfort here in this passage, that I think we can take from this, is that Jesus is willing to reach out His hand in the middle of the storm and take hold of us and bring us in. Now He does say to Peter, it's you a little faith. Now I think that's interesting, it's a you a little faith. Because Peter did step out of the boat. So even in his little faith, he was doing something that was impossible. So even if you think that I don't have enough faith, but Jesus indicates here that Peter didn't have a lot of faith, yet he was able to do something that was, uh, that was impossible. And then he asked, why do you doubt? And we have to ask ourselves that sometimes. Christ has asked us, no, why are you doubting? Trust me, trust me, trust me, and I'll help you through the struggles. Some people say, I'm not strong enough, I'm so new to my faith, I don't have enough faith. But look at Peter in his, in his early stages of his faith. He walks in the water, it's not, it's not necessarily the size of your faith that matters, it's the doubt that can make the difference. You see, it doesn't matter how much faith you think or, or you, you have or don't have, it's not that what we're looking for. And the scripture tells us, even the faith of a mustard seed, now if you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's the little tiniest See that you might never see, might see, even the faith of a mustard seed can do great things. It's our doubt that gets us into trouble. Will you keep your eyes on Jesus? Will you step out and do what seems impossible? Or will you let doubt keep you from what you can do? Will you be the next Peter, stepping out when out when the rest say, stay in the boat? Now, because it's interesting here, as soon as they get in the boat, you know, Peter's done taking this, taking this jump of faith. But as soon as Jesus and Peter get into the boat, what do we see happen? Everything's calm and relaxed. And they begin to truly realize that you truly, Jesus is the Son of God, tells us in the Spirit. <laughs> Will you do that?